Well, hello and welcome to Insight with Political Tours and Beyond the Headlines. When barrister Philippe Sands took a trip to Lviv in 2010, he gave a lecture at a Ukrainian law faculty that he had little idea perhaps about the consequences of that visit. That journey led him to write two books, East West Street and then The Rat Line, books which in my view are among the most influential to have been written about the Holocaust in recent years. They combine personal history and memoir with law, detective work, and storytelling that ranks with any best-selling thriller. They also look at how we assess and understand those terrible events some 80 years ago. Hello and welcome, Philippe Sands. Hi, it's very, very good to be with you, Nicholas, and um, glad to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Great, well, thank you very much indeed. We're going to focus mainly on your latest book, The Rat Line, but I do want to start briefly with East West Street. For those who possibly haven't read either books, I think it actually helps to make sense of things by starting here um, and where you unearth a coincidence, one of very many in the books, about your family and two men who in legal terms essentially define the crimes of the Holocaust. Um, so can you first of all tell us what was East West Street, the actual street, and how did these men's lives overlap, including the life of your grandfather? Well, East West Street was once called Lemberger Strasse, the street to Lviv, the street to Lvov. It's in a small, very small town, four or 5,000 people, today called Zhovkva in Ukraine, it used to be called Zhulkiev uh, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, and then Poland and today um, Ukraine. And it happens to be the street on which Hirsch Lauterpacht was born, probably the most influential international law of the 20th century, and the man who drove crimes against humanity as a legal concept into the international legal order, and who basically did the first draft of texts on modern human rights, so hugely influential. His son happened to be my first teacher of international law, Eli Lauterpacht, at university in the UK. And by astonishing coincidence, uh, I discovered in writing the book, my great grandmother was born on the same street as him. Uh, and um, the term East West Street uh, is taken from uh, an essay by the great writer Joseph Roth. Um, and it sort of situates this place at the sort of fault line between East and West. I mean, Ukraine, you know, as you know well, is a today a sort of divided country. Um, half points to the West and the European Union, half points to the East, the Russian Federation, and there is a conflict which has gone on for decades, if not centuries. Um, Lviv was Lemberg nearby, and it was the Western outpost of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and it had a pretty fabulous university, strong in mathematics and physics, but also in law. And two of its pupils, although not at the same time, were Raphael Lemkin, who would go on to invent the concept of genocide, the killing of groups, and Hirsch Lauterpacht, who would coin crimes against humanity as a legal term. So mm. it's a deeply intellectual, political, complex place in which different communities come together. And the incredible thing about the book is that I mean, you managed to weave this tale that tells both the evolution of both those ideas, um, genocide and crimes against humanity, which I know we could get into, but we won't just now. Um, and then your own family history. And if you haven't read that book, it really is, that's the one to, to start with. Um, but I, we're going to focus a bit more on the rat line here, which is your, your, your latest book uh, in a second. The link to the rat, rat, rat line you can see in the chat. If you click on the chat um, box in the bottom here, everyone watching, you'll find links to the rat line on both on um, Amazon, Waterstones in the UK, and also for, from independent booksellers in the UK. So you can do have a look at that if you want to, if you want to get the book. We'll talk about the rat line in a moment, but I just want to give people a kind of the, the flavor of the coincidences the stories that come up there, which make this such a, a deeply moving book. And, and I'd like you to focus on one example, and that's Miss Tilney of Norwich, mm. who's a very unlikely character, 
but arguably without her and her sort of um, ideology ideas, you might not exist. Oh, you I wouldn't exist at all. I mean, yeah. I owe my being to the extraordinary Elsie Tilney. Um, in brief, my grandfather's born in Lemberg, Lviv. He lives there until the age of 10. The Russians then occupy the city and he and many others leave. He goes with his mum and his two sisters. His brother has been killed in the first days of the First World War and his dad supposedly dies of a broken heart. And he goes to live in Vienna where he becomes a, he runs a small alcohol uh, distillery shop um, on Taborstrasse, which the street still exists today in central Vienna. And he's Jewish and he marries in 38, uh, or 37. And in 38, he and his wife, my grandmother, produce a child, my mother. And then in March 39, the Germans arrive, the Anschluss takes place and he leaves. I actually always had thought they left together. No one will ever talk about it in the family about mm. exactly what had happened. And they go to Paris. In fact, they go at different times. My grandfather goes first. Then my mother follows uh, six months later in uh, July 1939, aged one by herself. And this was the mystery. Um, when I first went to Lviv in response to a request to give an, uh, a lecture, an invitation to give a lecture, um, I accepted because I wanted to find the house where my grandfather was born, which I didn't find. To find it, I needed documents. I asked my mother whether she had any documents and she came into her living room with two sort of big bags and I put them out and I found a tiny slip of paper, um, folded tiny, one inch by an inch and a half. And it just said, Miss E. Tilney, uh, Manuka, Bluebell Road, Norwich, Angleterre. And um, I said to my mother, what's this? And she said, I don't know. And I didn't quite believe her that she didn't know completely, but she didn't really want to talk about it. So I went about finding who Miss Tilney was, and I describe it in the book. I mean, I have a wonderful editor in New York, Vicky Wilson, who said, Philippe, the, you know, you're a lawyer, you're useless at many things, but the one thing lawyers know how to do is find things. And she said, people are interested in how you find things. So you start with the name Miss Tilney from Norwich. And I just started with the phone books and the birth records and the censuses around Norwich, and there were unbelievably three female E. Tilney. Why, why did you pursue it? Because, I mean, it's a scrap of paper with a name on it, and your mother slightly dismissed it. So what gave you that little inkling? You know, to it's think a hunch, like... you know, you've had your life as a journalist, you know, you just have a sixth sense. You can't, there's something there. And it's when you're in court, it's the same thing. You you spend hours and things are going on and you're watching and it's boring and you're listening and you're half switched on and half switched off, but attentive. And you pick up something, there's something that is there and you follow your hunch. And I just had a hunch that, well, you don't keep a piece of paper for no reason. And the question is, what is the reason? So the, the journey to find Miss Tilney was not easy. It turns out there were quite a few Miss Tilneys mm -hmm. in and around Norwich. And I went through a process of elimination and eventually discovered that uh, our Miss Tilney was a truly remarkable human being, an evangelical Christian missionary who had gone on mission to North Africa to bring Muslims and Jews to Jesus. No evidence that she ever was successful with even one. Um, but uh, to get from Norwich to North Africa, you had to go by train via France. And so she would spend time in Paris. And there in 1939, working in a soup kitchen, she met my granddad. And my granddad says, I've got a six month old child. Would you go and get her? And she went and got her. And of course, what's very moving is that she, um, she went to pick up two girls. And the second girl, my mum's cousin, her mother, at the last minute said, I can't bear to be parted from her. And that little girl and her mother were dead within a couple of years in the ghetto in Lodge. I could have stopped there, but I couldn't. I became so interested in Miss Tilney that I went on and on and on and discovered the incredible life she had later on in Stalag 127 for Canadian, American and British ladies residing in France who were enemy aliens. And there, as I describe in the book, she did even more extraordinary things. I mean, 
she is the kind of person who reminds you never judge mm. a book by the cover if i were to meet her in the street and have a natter with her i think oh mm. God, straight lace I've, I've got to read that passage because this is this is um down to it's, there's a couple of passages from the bible that um her pastor took literally and this is from romans 1 16 yeah i'm not ashamed of the good news of christ for it is the power of God for salvation for everybody who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. And it's that little, those, those three words, well, so those four words, for the Jew first, that you exist. Well, what had happened was she had a pastor, um, David Panton in Norwich, who would send her in France his weekly sermons. And he sent one which was about this single line, Paul's letter to the Romans, line 10. And um, she thought, okay, he's a good man. I'm going to uh, take it to heart and I will start saving these people. And in fact, she didn't only save Jews, she saved anyone who was a political undesirable. Mm. Um, and I did meet, as I described, one remarkable lady who was imprisoned with her for four years in Vitel. Uh, now today a five-star hotel interestingly enough and she described to me this woman Shula Tromans was a secret Jew and she'd been incarcerated as a British national and was absolutely terrified that the camp commandant would discover that she was Jewish because she would then be deported to Auschwitz and she described to me one day work, walking in the corridor of what is what was a hotel is once again a hotel hmm. miss she, she observed miss tilney coming down the corridor towards her and just before they reached each other miss tilney fell to her knees and miss troman said what are you doing she said i know your story i will look after you and it's very affecting it's you know here is hmm. There is a lady, Miss Tilney, who risked her own life. Uh, and when well, once the book had come out, I did send all the documents to Yad Vashem, and she was recognised as a as a righteous amongst the nations. Which, of all the many lovely things that have happened with East West Street, mm. that I really cherish. I mean, she was a remarkable person, and I've met many of. Her, she never had kids or anything, but they were distant family members. Okay, it, it's absolutely amazing. Your, the second book is The Rat Line, and the focus in the way we've you've just told an incredible story, but the focus really of this second book um, is not on the victims, it's on the perpetrators. So what drew you to the life of the key character in this book, and that's Otto Wachter? Can you just explain who Otto Wachter was and, and why you were drawn to looking at him? Otto Wachter was an Austrian. Married to Charlotte, another Austrian, deeply nationalistic, deeply anti-Semitic, actually started law school at the University of Vienna in 1919 on the same day as Hirsch Lauterpacht, whose family he would exterminate 25 years later. I, did an, I went to an amazing event at the University of Vienna in December 2019, the centenary of the two men's arrival at the law school, and it was really amazing that the law school marked that moment with an amazing event um and he then slowly joins the nazi party very early 1921 and 1923 and and he climbs his way up the greasy pole and crosses lines very early beats people up tries to kill the austrian chancellor does succeed in killing him flees and eventually he gets a high-ranking position after the Anschluss, and then becomes governor of krakow he is the architect of the Krakow ghetto, um, and he then is posted to Lemberg to be governor of District Galicia, where he um, oversees the implementation of the final solution, the results of the Vanze conference, basically sweeping up hundreds of thousands of people for which he will be indicted for mass murder, including my grandfather's family, Lauterpak's family, and Lemkin's family. And of course, one of the remarkable stories in East West Street is Lauterpacht and Lemkin end up prosecuting his boss, Hans Frank, mm. at the Nuremberg trial without knowing 
that the man they're prosecuting is responsible for the deaths of their entire family. So you really almost couldn't invent it. Anyway, Hans Frank became the fourth character in East West Street. And through that, I came to know one of Hans Frank's children, Nicholas Frank, a very distinguished journalist, foreign editor of Stern, um, really a wonderful man who's become a very good friend. And at a certain point, at some point in early 2011, he said, oh, you're interested in Lemberg, that's where your grandfather's from. Would you like to meet the son of the former governor, Otto, Otto Wächter? His, he was my father's deputy. Uh, and his son is a good mate of mine, Horst Wächter. And so he introduced me to Horst. And that was really how the rat line began. Um, my fascination with Horst. One thing led to another. I mean, I wrote a profile of Horst for the Financial Times that caused a BBC film to be made, um, Storyville, My Nazi Legacy, um, and then a podcast for the BBC, The Rat Line, came out of some documents, the entire private family archive that Horst gave me um, in the making of the film. And the podcast was, of course, the, the subject also uh, of a book. So, but for Hans Frank and Otto Wächter, I would never have met Nicholas and, and Horst. Incidentally, Nicholas's book, The Father, which was published in Germany in 1987, has never been published in Britain, will be published this July, I've done a preface for it, uh, by Biteback, and it is an extraordinary book. Excellent. I will, I will certainly get that. The, the thing that also makes it so compelling is the relationship between Horst uh, and his father. And um, I mean, I think if you've listened to the podcast, it's, it's, it's partly there, but you go, in, you go on this journey in which Horst is repeatedly challenged with the evidence. Could you say a bit more about this and Horst's struggle? When Nicholas Frank introduced me to Horst Fechter, he said two things. Firstly, Philly, you will like him, which I do. And secondly, you will not like his views, which I don't. Um, and what he meant was, as he put it to me, Horst is not like me. I detest my father. My father deserved to be hanged for the murder of millions of human beings. Horst looks for the good in his father. In fact, the way Horst puts it is that it is his duty as a son. It's sort of an honorable expression. It's my duty as a son to find the good in my parents, to find the good in my father. And I've come to understand that Horst's approach to his father is motivated, I think not so much by a love of his father, but a love of his mother to whom he was very close. And the mother loved the father and Horst has transferred his loyalty to his mother to carrying on his mother's whitewashing exercise. So often Horst would say to me, there's no, yes, I know my father was a Nazi. And the thing about Horst is he's not a Holocaust denier. He's not an anti-Semite, he's not a racist. He's really a sweet and decent person who just wants to find the good in his dad in the face of compelling evidence to the contrary. And he would often say, oh, there's no evidence, there's nothing. And so I made it my task to see what I could find. And I found a lot. I found photographs of Otto engaged in acts, executing completely innocent kids, basically. Dreadful acts of reprisal. Um, an indictment by the Americans and the Poles for mass murder, more than 100,000 human beings. The evidence is overwhelming. All of Otto Wächter's closest colleagues either committed suicide between 1945 and 1946, or they were tried, convicted, and sentenced to death and executed. And I often say to Horst, if your dad had been caught, I can tell you 100%, he would have been convicted, crimes against humanity and genocide, and he would have been uh, executed. But he was never caught. And that's where the story, I think, takes an important direction for me, but also for Horst and the family, because mm -hmm. Otto Wächter was never apprehended and therefore never tried, although indicted. As Horst puts it, he died an innocent man. And that is correct in strictly formal terms. And I suppose in a way you can understand the writing of the rat line as a desire to find out the facts and to write in a sense amongst other things, the judgment that no court ever handed down in relation to Horst's father. That, that's what I was going to ask. So essentially, you, your conviction, your pursuit of this 
was essentially to hold that trial post factum? I mean, it certainly wasn't my intention. You know, I didn't, I'd never intended to write East West Street and I never intended to write the rat line. I mean, the rat line, the first idea came in a conversation at the BBC who invited me in to make a three part series on the history of international law. And they said, anything else you got that's interesting. And I had just received this incredible USB stick with 10,000 pages of family material, as mentioned it. They said, oh, that sounds interesting. And was soon commissioned, it took two years to make it. I worked quite slowly um, to make the podcast. And literally as soon as it had been commissioned, my editor at Weidenfeld said, oh, well, if you're gonna do a podcast, you should turn it into a book. So that was how it began. Um, and I hadn't appreciated how much interest there would be. I sort of thought I'd exhausted it. Um, you know, there'd been an article in the FT and there'd been a film and I thought, well, enough's enough. But the appetite seems to be insatiable. And I think the reason for that is that we don't know so much about the lives of the couples at the top tables. I think a book just about Otto, frankly, would not have the interest. For me, the most remarkable character is Charlotte. Um, the wife, the mother, the grandmother. And why is she remarkable? She's remarkable because she is truly ghastly and appalling, but she's also fabulous and heroic. She loves her man. And after the war, she will do anything she can to save him. And she is a world-class athlete. And she uses those skills and her love to save her husband's life in remarkably difficult circumstances when he's being hunted all over Europe. Um, and I'm fascinated in that relationship. You know, they're together for 20 years. For the first 15 years, Otto's the one in charge until the 9th of May, 1945. He's the boss, he's off having affairs and she's punishing him and all sorts of things going on, which are all in the letters and all described um, in the book. But on the 9th of May, everything changes. He's a man on the run and the only person who's going to look after him is his wife and she does. She saves him. And the power, you can feel the power shift really from literally one day to the next and he is utterly dependent on her. And I'm fascinated by that relationship and by what she does to save her man, which is by any standard admirable. I mean, you know, would that we would have a partner who would go to the ends of the world for us as she did until right at the end mm. when he decides to go to Argentina. Um, and I, I, you keep sort of preempting my questions, but, but it seems to me that in, in explaining um, going to such depth in that relationship, but also um, the kind of lives they had, you talk about her taking over a villa, you know, going to the opera, um, you, you get a sense of people who are educated, urbane, and even have a sort of strong sense of their own sort of morality. And yet here they are involved at the, the, the completely at the top end of things, orchestrating the final solution, if you like. Um, I think you and, and Stephen Fry read out some of the correspondence between Otto and his, and, uh, his wife um, that sort of highlights them going to opera. Um, opera. Um, Hans Frank, you know, very musical. And I think at one point the Wachters even take a tour of the ghetto with their house guests. So the, the, so the question we ask ourselves today is how could anyone be a Nazi? And I suppose you're saying this is how. I'm saying they're regular folk. I mean, they're, you know, they're not monsters. They do monstrous things. But a monster is not capable of love and decency and generosity and humanity. And both these characters are. And that's what's so difficult and problematic and compelling. We could sit at a dining table and have a perfectly lovely and interesting evening with them. They don't have monster written on their forehead. They don't have mass murder written on their forehead. And what I'm fascinated about is how people have dual identities. And we know this from our own daily life. We know there are people around us who do the most terrible things but are also capable of magnificent things. Mm. And 
you know, a few people have said, oh, you never describe him as a monster. You never describe her as a monster. That's too simplistic. You know, I don't buy Hannah Arendt's thesis in relation to the vectors. The banality of evil doesn't work for them. They knew the banality of evil on Hannah Arendt's thesis posits the idea that they were unthinking, dutiful, went around their daily jobs. And this is just what happened. They didn't really think about it. These guys knew exactly what they were doing. You know, there's the, it's in the correspondence. Tomorrow, darling, I have to have 50 poles shot. Oh, the, there's no Jews around to put powder on the tennis courts anymore. They're all being sent to other places, evacuated. Um, they knew everything. And this is what is so troubling. Mm. How could people so, who are so highly cultured do such terrible things? And one of the themes of the book is, I don't articulate it explicitly, but one of my theses is that you have to be very careful about crossing lines. If you allow lines to be crossed, one thing leads to another. And if the skies don't cave in on you, when you cross a relatively insignificant line, you think, okay, well, that wasn't so bad. I'll go to the next line. And that's Vecht's life. You can see his life as a series of lines crossed until at the end he's involved in industrial scale mass murder. And I think there are lessons for us right now about this. I mean, after the events in Washington on the 6th of January, Arnold Schwarzenegger put out an absolutely incredible video. I don't know if you saw it, um, which is worth just Googling and just watching. It's a seven minute video, which, in which he appears with the sword of Conan the Barbarian, who he played in some film years ago. And his basic message is, I'm Austrian. He's reporting on the situation after the storming of the Capitol on the second. Mm. I know about these things. Be very, very careful. And he's right, because lines get crossed. One thing leads to another. I don't think we're at that point in Britain, but we are seeing certain lines being crossed in this country, and other countries are seeing it in Poland, in Hungary, in various other places. And I think it's a dangerous moment. And part of the reason that I think it's a dangerous moment is history shows what happens when you cross lines in this way. Okay. I'm really glad you mentioned that, um, that last bit. Um, you, you know, I was a journalist. I worked in Southeastern Europe for um, a, a long time. And a lot of my time was spent looking at war crimes and in some cases actually pursuing war criminals. Um, and I've always felt that something that's really struck me is that um, uh, there is an enormous consciousness around uh, anti-Semitism, um, crimes against humanity connected with the Holocaust to the extent that there are people who are being prosecuted or have been prosecuted in their late, late 90s, who you could argue have had a very peripheral role yeah. in, in, the, in that process, nevertheless, we think, why weren't they tried those many years ago? Yes, at the same time, there are war crimes that are being committed today, have been committed in Syria, and certainly I know of people in the Balkans who are former police chiefs, current politicians, you know, ordinary people who are still running around with a significant amount of, you know, blood on their hands. But our, our consciousness seems to be to ch channel down this funnel that says this happened 80 years ago and this is the problem that this could happen again and and i worry i i do i do find it very problematic that um uh we look down one street but not down the other well i mean it's firstly the, these themes are universal like you i mean i was very involved in former yugoslavia and i'm acutely aware of what is around the corner i, I think just stepping back slightly the 1945 moment was an incredible moment. Um, you know, we went from a world with a fairly rudimentary idea of international order and rules to one which was transformed. It was almost a, it was a revolution, which basically said that the powers of the sovereign are not unlimited anymore. That's it, it's finished. Those days are over, rights for individuals, rights for groups, processes, and so on and so forth. And a number of countries were very deeply involved in that, but two of the leading countries were the United States and Britain, but particularly the United States, in pushing for a rules-based system in which there were certain fundamentals, including rights 
for non-statal actors, human beings, corporations, whatever it is. And certainly until the change with the Biden administration, I think you had the situation in which Britain and the United States were effectively tearing down the order that they had constructed. I mean, uh, for me, uh, this is not a party political point, but making America great again and Brexit essentially share the desire to bring sovereignty home, whatever that means, to limit the writ of external institutions, judges, legislators, who could somehow tell us Americans and Brits what to do. And bit by bit, those two countries over three or four years, and this government in Britain still today, have turned their back on the order they created in 1945. And I'm troubled by what that means, because basically, I think it's not perfect. I'm not starry eyed about that order, but it's better than the alternative. And I think particularly in Britain right now, there's a lot of tearing down going on and a lot less thought about what's actually going to replace it. And I'm worried about that, what that is going to lead to. OK, Let, let's start taking people's questions. Um, so if you can, everyone can just start writing their questions in the Q&A box, right hand side of my screen, maybe elsewhere on yours. And then we can start putting those to Philippe. Um, I, t I take your point, and I think many people watching this, uh, I mean, may be sympathetic with you, and one or two might not be. But then, half the country won't be, but that's... Yes. <laughs> well, I think there are quite a few people watching this, probably more on the liberal end of the perspective, but uh, we have a few more others as well. Um, but can I just bring you back to that specific question? When it comes to war crimes, it seems to me that uh, there's a consciousness about crimes committed 80, 80 years ago. And you know, admittedly, this is you know, genocide and on, uh, you know, the term genocide comes out of that period. The enormity of a state um, going out to execute a whole people is huge. We can't get by that. But yet there are these crimes taking place to get today that people are, have, have no interest uh, um, in. I'll give you an example of a very concrete story. Um, I tracked down uh, a guy called Slobodan Davidovic, who was involved in Srebrenica. After me finding him, he was arrested. He was sentenced to four years. He is the exception, not the rule. It's very unusual uh, that a, a fairly low person, he was about a, a level of a, um, a rank of a sergeant, gets prosecuted and sentenced to that amount of time. By generally, all of those people who are involved in that kind of thing yeah. are walking free this today. Yet, um, it, within the same year or a couple of years later, um, a 92-year-old former Hungarian soldier was um, uh, stopped, was, um, had charges brought against him for uh, a, the ki killing of people in Niche, in, um, in Novi Sad, uh, in northern Serbia. Um, and that, I mean, I, I get why the trial was put forward, but in terms of priorities, I just don't get it. I don't see how all these other people are running around and we don't give a damn about it. But, but I think you have to put it in a much broader historical context. You're absolutely right. It's, it's a completely uneven, lopsided, limited, broadly ineffectual, uneven system. But isn't that the case in a broader historical context? I mean, you know, we now in this country live with the fruits of decades of despoliation of others. And the question of accepting the idea that there has been wrongdoing in the past and having consequences today, we don't deal with it in relation to our own past. I mean, I'm right now, I'm, I'm, I have this in mind because I've uh, given a lecture in a couple of weeks on the question of whether there can be reparations in relation to enslavement or the consequences of enslavement. And you go into the historical material, and it is really staggering, that compensation was paid in vast amounts to the owners of slaves, but no compensation has ever been paid to those who are enslaved. Isn't that the same thing that you're saying really, but in a different relation? In other words, we cherry pick from whatever our perspective is, as to what are the crimes and the horrors we want to come down on like a ton of bricks. And we turn a blind eye to those which are normalized uh, or internalized. There is an unevenness 
to what goes on. And if you put it in its historical context, the unevenness becomes even more apparent. Take Nuremberg. I mean, the decision was taken at Nuremberg that there'd be only one category of defendants, only the German side. So the Italians were off the hook, Soviets were off the hook, the British were off the hook, the Americans were off the hook, terrible things were done. And that has been taken forward. If you go straight now onto the website of the International Criminal Court in The Hague, you will observe that there are 30 individuals who have been indicted for international crimes since the ICC was created in 1998. Every single one of those 30 people are black and African. Do blacks and Africans have a monopoly on international crime? They do not. Something has gone wrong. It's a lopsided system. And what you're describing, I think, is present. Although you could say that the ICTY was separate to the ICC, and so therefore you get a lot of people who are not black who might not be, who might otherwise have been within the ICC. So um, yeah, there were very few people who can that argue that. <laughs> You, you t- I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that really runs. That was that. Then they tried to be even-handed, and that was very problematic. They wanted to make sure there were a certain number of defendants who were Bosnian Muslims, a certain number who were Croats, a certain number who were Serbs, and then if the numbers ran a bit askew, you know the famous judgment in Gotovina, um, a Croat military guy. You know how he was left off, let off the hook by the appeals committee is probably only explicable by reference to the totality of convictions and keeping a sort of rough balance between them. So it's a filthy game mm. still today. And yeah, it's all I, guess, I guess what I'm saying is that I think there should be more debate about it. Just if we can have a debate about um, you know, slavery going back 300 years, let's at least talk about some of the, the major war crimes in our own neighborhood. I agree, but again, let's not forget that this idea of international crimes, including war crimes, is a totally recent invention. It's a 1945 mm-hmm. moment. And you can't suddenly expect countries, rulers to come together and say, oh, well, we're going to have war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. The whole thing is not suddenly going to stop and people start behaving themselves. And secondly, it's not going to be applied in an even way. It's a very long game. And I think the inadequacies of the system as it is today should not allow us to conclude, oh, it's all hopeless, we might as well give up. It is imperfect. We're not starry-eyed about it. We know that. Your points are well, well taken. But, you know, I, I used to teach in Cambridge. I was a fellow research fellow at St. Catharines, and there was a wonderful pro- professor of English legal history, Sir John Baker, an extraordinary individual. And occasionally, as a young academic, he'd, he'd invite me for lunch. And he'd say, well, what are you working on, Philippe? And I'd say this, that, the other. And John Baker would say, oh, yes, yes, yes. We had a similar problem in English law in about 1472, and it took 273 years to sort it out, and we're still not quite there. It's a long game. It's, it's, we're, we're, in the, we're in the medieval age of international relations and law, and that's how we have to think about it. Okay, let's start taking those, bringing those questions in. I'm impatient, that's why. Um, uh, Philip Godfrey, go ahead, Philip. Uh, can you hear me, Nick? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Philippe, um, fantastic books. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed The Rat Line. Um, when I read it, I was taken by the fact it was a very personal story. Um, and it, it dealt at a, a sort of a minute level with Charlotte and Otto and getting through the mountains and escaping into Italy and so on and so forth. But the thing that struck me most at the end of the book was a, a feeling that um, maybe the way that you described the international order at the, 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 the end of the Second World War was that the cynical uh, sort of a approach of the allies was basically, we now have the communist threat to deal, to deal with. And basically, you know, the Nazi past is the past mm-hmm. and we're now going to move on. And that was the thing that really didn't shake me, but it, would, it was impressed upon me, this idea that um, there's a sort of real politic 
that was, it, you know, you ended on. And I wondered when you wrote the book with the personal themes and narratives, which are clearly, you know, important to you, whether you ended up feeling rather cynical. I've got to say that there's such a twist in the end of that book that it picks up on that story. And I'm not going to mention it because you haven't read the story. It's just mind blowing. Um, yeah. And it goes it goes down the generations to the to today. It's absolutely amazing. Well, Andrew Faulkner, yeah, really. who said the, the past is never dead. It's not even the past. Yeah. Um, I mean, what Philip? What I came across just surprised me completely. I had no idea. I've known Horst Vechter for ten years. For the first five years, I was basically focused on what his mum and dad did, or what his dad did up until 1945, I really didn't, you know, I knew he died in strange circumstances, but I didn't focus on it. And then in 2014, 15, he gives me all these documents. And all of a sudden, I've got in black and white, what happened after the 9th of May, 1945. And it's the material is irresistible. I mean, anyone can go and see it now. It's just gone up on the website of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. You go on their website, type in Vector, and you can just look at it. And all of a sudden, I had this material. He had escaped. He'd gone to hide in the mountains with Bukha Ratman. He had crossed the Dolomites. He had descended to Rome. He had been taken in by the religious gentleman who's unnamed. So I and my fabulous researchers um, thought, well, this is interesting. Let's start excavating here and find out what on earth is going on. And of course, what we stumbled across without realizing what was there was exactly what you said, that the Americans and the British had turned on a sixpence, as John le Carre put it. And instead of hunting Nazis to prosecute them, they started to hunt them to recruit them. I mean, you know, I'd heard, you know, we'd all heard about Werner von Braun and the scientists, and we thought, okay, we can understand that. They're, they're scientists, they're not mass murderers. They're just, you know, chemists and physicists and biologists. and. But these are SS generals who are involved in industrial mass murder, who are now being recruited as agents and spies and collaborators. And of course, it turns out that the rat line, the escape route from Italy to South America, is basically run by us as a recruitment tool to, as John le Carre put it to me, get hold of the Rolodexes of these characters because they knew where the communists were. Italy in 1948 was the place that was thought to be the launching pad for communism in Western Europe. And as you know, in that famous election, the Americans put huge amounts of effort into stopping the left from winning the election and they succeeded. The Christian Democrats were brought in and everything that came with the Christian Democrats, including, you know, Brigata Rosso and in the 70s and in the 80s, is a reflection of what happened in that moment. I didn't know that when I started, and it was a shock, I have to say. But I'm not a cynical person. I, you know, it's like the answer that I gave on doing justice on international crimes. It's a long game. The world is an absolutely filthy place. It's as filthy today. You know, my enemy's friend is my friend, even if they're a dreadful person. You know, we're in bed with MBS in Saudi Arabia. He's a murderer. And yet he gives us money for our weaponry and gives us a bit of access to oil and so on and so forth. It's a filthy, filthy place. You've got to read. You've got to read the book and get to the end of that because the um, the twists and turns of it, you know, are, are, are stranger than fiction. Um, let, let's bring um, Adrian Kassar's uh, got a question. Uh, Adrian, I can ask it for you, but if you yeah, go on, you 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 ask your question. Okay, again. thank you. Thanks, Nick, and thanks, Philip, for your for your discussion this evening. Brilliant books and the interview actually you did with John Le Carre, sadly departed, which I found. I thought it was fascinating too. How we miss him, how we miss him. Yes, mm. yes. Uh, my, my question was, um, how do we deal with um, genocide, um, particularly in China, from a, from a perspective of international humanitarian law, from uh, um, 
How do we get a grip on it? Well, I mean, I'm obviously following what's happening with the Uyghurs very closely. I, I've written a couple of pieces, one in the FT, one in the New Statesman, and I've questioned the use of the G word. Um, the political reality is that if an American president says that someone's committing crimes against humanity, no one pays the blindest bit of notice. But if an American president says it's genocide, everyone goes, oh, well, we've got to pay attention to this. And it goes on the front page of the newspapers. We saw that a couple of weeks ago when President Biden finally broke ranks with his predecessors and characterized what had happened in 1915, Ottoman Empire against the Armenians as a genocide, as Raphael Lemkin had done. Of course, the issue with that is the term genocide did not exist in 1945. And the G word exercises tremendous traction and power. It's very fascinating. I, I've reflected long and hard as to why that is. I'm not sure whether it's the magic of the word. I'm not sure whether it's the implication about the destruction of groups rather than individuals, but it just gets a lot more attention. Victims, prosecutors at all the courts will tell you victims want the crime that has been perpetrated against them to be the worst of the worst. And that means genocide. And they don't want war crimes. They don't want crimes against humanity. And hence, when the nasty stuff, and it is nasty, it seems, that's going on against the Uyghurs is exposed, there is a rush to give it as much attention as possible. And that is materialized by calling it genocide. I don't see how on the basis of what is available at the moment, what is happening would be called by an international court as genocide. It is certainly a crime against humanity. Philip, let, let's, just, let's just qualify that again, because I mean, I think most, most people watching have an idea of what genocide is, but in terms of, and looking at what the Chinese are doing with the Uyghurs, if they are, they're clearly trying to wipe out the culture they're trying to um, prevent Uyghurs from they're taking away their children, uh, giving them to, to Chinese families. Um, they're, there's the getting rid of the religion, the curbing their language. Uh, there's a sort of mass indoctrination program. You know, that, that's getting pretty close, isn't it? I mean, not talking about mass executions, but you are talking about wiping out a culture. Got to, wiping got to, out a, a got national to go culture. back to 1946 and 48 and the debate that happened. That was Raphael Lemkin's definition of genocide. Absolutely clearly, Lemkin would characterize this on his original definition as a genocide, but his definition is not what is in the 1948 convention. And the price he had to pay to get his idea into a treaty was to cut certain things out of the definition. And cultural genocide is not included in the 1948 convention. You have to prove an intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. And that has been interpreted and applied by international courts and tribunals as having a very high threshold. I failed in various instances before international courts to get the threshold to be lowered. So when I say I don't think it and it's intent, isn't it? It's proving that intent, the intent to actually exterminate a people, which is part of the, the critical thing. To destroy a group in whole or in part. It's mm. really difficult. Perpetrators tend not to leave bits of paper around saying, oh, and I'm doing this in order to destroy the group in whole or in part. You're left to infer from a pattern of behavior. Now, it may well be that there is evidence that will emerge which indicates that, that is what China is doing but on the basis of what's publicly available at the moment mm. i don't think the international court of justice would characterize what's happening as a genocide i think they would characterize it as a crime against humanity and my position has been why should we give a toss whether it's called genocide or crime against humanity a crime against humanity is not a lesser crime i mean if you kill fifty thousand people that is going to be a crime against humanity whether you kill them with the intention to destroy them as a group in whole or in part, or just kill them, why mm. is it a lesser crime just to kill them without being able to prove that intent? To my mind, it's not. But in popular consciousness, a crime against humanity doesn't do the trick. Only genocide does the trick. And so we've got ourselves into this difficulty. There's a second reason. 
There is a 1948 convention on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity. There is no international convention on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity. One has been drafted and it lingers right now before the General Assembly of the United Nations, but our esteemed government, it may now change with the Biden administration, opposes it. And the reason that they oppose it is that they are at risk themselves, Mr. Raab and Mr. Johnson, having been accused of a crime against humanity in relation to the treatment of the Chagossians, forcibly removed from the Chagos archipelago 50 years back, now determined by an international court to have a right to return, and the British government won't let them go back. And that falls squarely, in my view, in the views of many others, within Article 7 of crime against humanity, forcible uh, removal and prohibition to allow them to return. But the upshot is genocide is what gets people excited. And I think that that's a problem. Yeah, no, Janet, um, messy. Um, Tim Ripley, question from you, please. Go ahead, Tim, if you're there. Go on, Tim. Open your microphone, please. All right, there we go. Hello. Hi, Hi Tim. Good to see you. Um, I, I enjoyed very much your, your television program where you went back to Galicia and, and traced your, yeah. your, back to your home village. And what I was particularly interested in was the reaction of the local people when you took back the relatives of, of their previous SS masters. Yeah. And what was quite remarkable from my view was actually they were quite popular with the local people. Still, their ancestors are still uh, considered to be of, 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 you know, that they were, they were very, um, they weren't remotely hostile to them and, and actually thought that, they, that their rule was, um, something that they quite liked oh. um, and, and uh, uh, they had that great ceremony, that great reenactment group who dressed up as um, the local Galicia militia and, and all that stuff, stuff sort of stuff. Um, I was um, now uh, this has since played out in, in, in the Donbass and in the Baltic states where the the, the sort of um, the the Russians play off the, 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 the linkages of the Ukrainian government and the Baltic states to the resistance movements who were before them were collaborating with the Nazis. So they're reenacting, um, I'm going to cut to the chase, they're basically sort of reenacting um, the, the Second World War with the Ukrainians unashamedly saying, you know, we are, um, you know, fighting it all over well, again. If, uh, you, if you want to uh, allow me, to, can, can I share screen here? No, if you want to allow me to yeah, share yeah, screen, on, I'll, I'll put a photo up. I think you've got to enable that. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've uh, just gone on to my, I've gone on to my, can you do that? Can you enable that? Yep. That's it. Okay. Great. Okay. There you are. Um, exactly. No, no. July, no. July, 2014. There I am. They are all loving meeting horse. Okay. The guy here in the sunglasses is calls himself Wolf Sturm. That is a genuine SS uniform, Waffen SS Galicia division. Um, this is a military cemetery, um, and uh, Horst was welcomed like a returning hero because of his father. By contrast, Nicholas Frank was absolutely horrified. At the end of that day, we went back to Lviv. We did a new interview with Nicholas, and Nicholas described Horst as maybe being a new kind of Nazi. Uh, Horst got very upset. Horst isn't a Nazi, in my view, uh, mm. not at all. And Horst at that point said, what can I do to prove I'm not a Nazi? And uh, any lawyer will tell you it's very difficult to prove a negative. I said, give all, give all the materials to a, to a museum. And Nazis don't give their family archives to museum. And that's what caused him to give me all the materials. Mm. And this moment is, in a sense, the catalytic moment for the rat line, so. But yeah. here's, the, here's the question, and instead of taking up on Tim's question, it does seem to be that in the fo many former communist states, there isn't that sense that they, they certainly don't te haven't taught the history of the Second World War or the Holocaust. I remember walking to a restaurant in Croatia in the late 1990s, and there were two photographs of the, in, of the um, uh, it was an SS division created in Croatia, and this restaurant owner was unashamedly had these photographs um, commemorating. It was, I think, it was the 50th or 
50th anniversary, possibly well, yeah, the 50th anniversary of the creation of the first Waffen SS uh, regiment in Croatia. Uh, and, and in Ukraine, it's particularly bad. You can go into downtown, um, uh, you know, downtown areas and you can go into a bookshop and the sort of Nazi memorabilia is there for you to buy. Um, I've been to similar places in Lviv. I've been to market stalls where you can buy all sorts of Nazi memorabilia. The Nazis are seen by many, but not the majority and not all, as the liberators of the Ukrainian people against the Soviets in 1941. And the Germans had the great merit of physically getting rid of the um, Poles mm. and limiting the place, uh, physically getting rid of the Jews and limiting the place of the Poles. And the Ukrainian community went from number three in the pecking order to number one. So if you were a Ukrainian, you'd have reason to feel rather grateful to the Germans uh, who mm. arrived. And that's the legacy that you're talking about. History is very complex. I mean, we see it from our perspective, but if you go to those kinds of places, there is another history and another vision and it's seen rather differently. Yeah. And they'll say to you, well, maybe they shouldn't have killed so many people, but basically they were decent folk. We've got limited time. I'm going to do something slightly different here. I'm actually going to bring in my mother here, Sarah Biffin, and with a, a bit of a story here. Now, one of the characters that crops up in your book um, is Joseph Torak, who was Hitler's, one of Hitler's favorite sculptors and Speer's favorite sculptor. And, and he used Torak to do a lot of uh, the, the sculptors on his sort of big, you know, huge, um, huge buildings. Um, our family knew his wife, and his wife had a very particular history. And I just want my mother briefly to talk about Gilda yeah, Torak. Right. Um, so if you're, you're there, mother. I uh, am. Just, just, just describe Gilda Torak and uh, say a bit about what we know about her. I knew her towards the end of her life. She had escaped. She was the Jewish wife of Joseph Torak, Hitler's sculptor, and very much rated by Speer. And in the design of all his grandiose buildings. She was helped to escape in 1938 or 39 with her son and eventually ended up in the UK teaching. And her son, uh, Peter, went to school with my late husband. But I enjoyed visiting her in her old age in a little cottage in Shropshire, where she would tell me how they knew Hitler and how she used to cook for him. He would visit there, I imagine chalet or something, I think in Austria, and she um, would cook um, you know, lunches, breakfasts, and said he had very bad manners. And I, he, must have, yeah, he must have known that she was part Jewish um, in, in the late 30s. And by 36 or 37, she had a passport with a large J stamped on it. Um, and eventually when she went to Britain, she spent much of the war, um, I didn't realize the story, she spent much of the war in an internment camp and then she was released. Um, but the, yeah, the, the links I, I wrote to you about. Well, life, is, life is very curious, you know. I mean, one of the nefarious characters in the rat line is the Austrian bishop, Alois Hudal. I was doing a, a radio show in, in, uh, in New Zealand a few months ago and someone called in and said, oh, well, in our family, we have a rather different view of Alevis Udall. And the lady said, my father was a, a young New Zealand um, soldier. He was caught. He went into a POW camp in Germany. He escaped. He made his way to the Vatican and he was given safety by Bishop Alevis Udall. So in our family in New Zealand, um, Udall is seen as rather a positive and decent fellow. You know, life is really complex and you learn, I think, never to judge things. Things are never only quite what they seem. Um, a journalist knows that like Nick. I know that as a lawyer. And this story that you've just told, Diana, is, 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 is fascinating um, in terms of, uh, of exactly that. Um, gosh, that would have been so fascinating. Torak, as you know, plays a minor role in the rat line. He appears because he was a neighbor of Charlotte's and she would go uh, animal spotting with him in the uh, mountains around Zell am Zee. But I didn't know he had a partly Jewish 
once wife actually that I didn't know okay well I think there we've we've got to wrap it up it's been a fa I'm sorry we haven't managed to get all the questions in but it's been a really really fascinating hour thank you very much indeed Philippe real pleasure uh, to be with you I've, I've, I've really enjoyed it thank you very much indeed for your time